I first I want to say thank you for all for being here. Thanks for coming. We're going to talk about journeys today. Journeys that have been taken and journeys that are yet to be taken. And how many are you familiar with the work of Michael Newton? You've heard of Michael's work. Great. For those who are not familiar, he's a hypnotherapist who practiced in Los Angeles in the 1950s and 60s. And I'm going to talk about him because that's, that's how I got involved in this research and this work. But you're probably wondering a little bit about who am I. So um, I went to Harvard and Yale. I didn't go to school there. I actually went to visit the campuses a couple times. Um, I had to take my graduate exams at Harvard because I went to BU across the river. And I was like, oh, no, I'm stuck in this place finally. And then Yale, I was writing a movie for HBO about the Medici family. And they paid for my trip there. So I was able to talk to some scholars about one of my favorite topics. But my journey really begins with the death of a very close friend of mine. Her name was Luana Anders. Um, and we had met in film school. Just to step back one second, I was sitting in a train station in Rome trying to decide what to do with my life. It's 20 years old. Do I want to work in film? Or do I want to be a writer? But I actually had the presence of mind to say, I'm going to flip a coin. And whatever that coin says, that'll be my life. Heads, I stay in Rome. Tails, I go to Los Angeles. Flip the coin, it came up. Heads, stay in Rome. And I thought, oh shit. <laughs> and then I thought, well, that must be a signal that it's time for me to go get on that train and go to Los Angeles, which I did. <laughs> and when I got there, I, you know, it was one of those odd things where you don't know anyone at school and, and somebody just stepped up and said, oh, you know, you can stay over here and you can get a loan here, you can do all these things. In Scott's at USC, one of my first classes, I turned and there was this very pretty blonde actress who was taking a screenwriting class and her name was Luana Anders and she appeared in you know, about 300 TV shows and 30 different movies, but I hadn't seen her before. But there was something about her that seemed really familiar to me. And we became friends. And, and eventually we moved in together. For 10 years we were lovers. And then we broke up at some point, as yes, it happens. But then we remained close friends for 10 years because there was something about our relationship that neither one of us could let go. So then unfortunately she got cancer in 95 as people do, and I helped her through that journey. But it was one afternoon, we were sitting around having cappuccinos, like we always did, on, uh, in her house, and she said, I think I'm going to another galaxy. I said, what do, you, what do you mean? She said, I have this recurring dream that I'm in a classroom, everyone's dressed in white, they're speaking a language I've never heard before, but I completely understand. And I thought, OK, that sounds like morphine. <laughs> um, classroom in the afterlife, huh? Wow, OK. Then the day she died, a close friend called and said, oh, I had the most wonderful dream about Luana last night. She was in the fourth dimension. And she was in a classroom. And everyone was dressed in white. And she seemed really happy. And I said, had she told you this? No. Then I mentioned it to the nurse who said, oh, my God, that was her dream. That was the recurring dream she had the last years of her life. And I thought to myself, classrooms in the afterlife. OK, that's outside my purview, but I'll keep a note of it. And then I also thought, gee, if I want to see her again, I better start studying up, because how do you get into that class? It's going to be difficult. I don't have you know, the credits to get to that class that she's in. But she was a Buddhist. So I thought, well, maybe that's a way to gain credits, to get into the class to find her. So I uh, was offered a job working in New York City with Charles Grodin, the actor and friend. And I was producing his show. And while I was producing the show, we had the opportunity to bring on James von Prague, you know, the renowned psychic. And um, so I said to Charles, why don't we see if we can talk to Luana? He said, how do we do that? I said, well, I'll call in. So we did it twice. He was on the show twice. I called in twice. 
you know, we just arranged it. No one knew that I was calling in. James von Prague didn't know I was calling in. But both times, very specific details of the manner of her death. You were holding her hand. You were sitting by her. She turned and looked and spoke to you. Is that correct? Very correct. Um, but the second time he did it, he said something really profound for me. Because, you know, it, as we all know in this research, you sort of have a certain part of you that goes, it feels really true, but I don't know if I can tell anybody about it. And in this particular case, uh, he said, there's a photograph on your refrigerator that's the essence of your relationship. Now, when I put this photograph of me and her on the fridge, it's the only time in my life I've ever spoken aloud about a photograph. And I said, well, that's the essence of our relationship. Me and her sitting in a cafe in Rome having a cappuccino laughing. But when he said those words, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, for me anyway, that, this, that he had to be in communication with her. So I started contemplating, what does that mean? How could he communicate? Where is she? If it's true that he can talk to her, she's got to be somewhere. So I started sort of thinking about how to find her. And I, like I said, I started taking classes in Tibetan philosophy because they're, you know, the Buddhist philosophy of the afterlife, et cetera, et cetera. It seemed like they knew that path. And Robert Thurman, Uma's dad, he's a professor at Columbia University. He teaches these deep doctoral <coughs> classes in philosophy, which were way over my head, but I took them. And uh, somewhere in that process, I had an out-of-body experience. And I was laying in my bed in my apartment in Upper West Side of Manhattan. And suddenly I shot out of my body. Now, has anybody had an out-of-body experience here? Some? And most people, you've heard of it. Robert Monroe wrote about it quite a bit, but it's that floating around outside of your body. Sometimes people have them during a near-death experience when they're in an operating table. You know, they see the doctors speaking. And sometimes they can actually see their body down below. And I've had that before. Never thought that much about it. Well, that's interesting. But in this case, it was completely different. And I, as I rose out of my body, I shot straight out into outer space. And as I was shooting through, I could see New York leaving me, you know, the way they do in the movies. And I was zooming through space, and I, could, I was aware the stars were sort of melting around me. And, and then at some point, I took a turn, is what it felt like, and then I went through some kind of a wormhole which is the only word we have for something like that, where you're going around and around. And then I was out on the other side, but still traveling at the same rate. But instead of going that way, I was going that way. It's the only way I can describe it, going sideways. So stars were kind of moving like this. And then I stopped, and there she was, standing in front of me. No feeling of euphoria or blissful or anything. Just there she was. She had her eyes closed, and she opened them looked at me, as if to say, you wondered where I was, here I am. And at that moment, I thought, well, this is, and now is my opportunity to find out. And somebody honked a horn outside my window, like a truck horn. But that kind of, you know, that you're, wherever you are in the universe, you're going to come to. But I had the profound experience of traveling back, like a rubber band being yanked. So if you just think about the math, between the time that he finished honking, maybe a half a second or a second, I traveled all that distance back. I saw New York coming up at a great rate of speed, and then I woke up. So, like anything, I thought, okay, that either was a dream or it was real. If she exists in this other galaxy, how can I go back? Is it possible? That was my premise. I'm going to find a way to go back and visit Luana. So here I was studying Tibetan philosophy. I ended up going to India with Thurman. I, I'm a filmmaker, so I had made some films, some regular films during the course of my career, comedies mostly, Charles Grodin movie and a couple of other films. But at this point, I started to make documentaries because I thought it was an interesting topic, you know, whatever it was. And so I wound up making a documentary in Tibet with Bob Thurman. It's called Journey into Tibet. And when Bob and I were trying to decide how to release it, we both came upon the conclusion that it should just go out into the world. 
it shouldn't be something we try to make money on because not everyone can go to Tibet. So if you want to go to Tibet, there is online YouTube Journey into Tibet, and you can take a two-hour trip with Bob Thurman in and around Lhasa and all those great places, and then we did a Korah around Mount Kailash. Now, anybody familiar about what Kailash is? Kailash is, okay. Kailash is considered the center of the universe for four major religions, Buddhism, Hindu, Jain, and the Bon center of the universe, so the most sacred spot. So I took my camera up there and I filmed this trip with Bob Thurman where we did a Korah around Kailash. And the way the story goes is if you do a Korah around Kailash, all the sins of your lifetime are washed away. Which I thought, well, that's a good opportunity. I, I appreciate that. That's great. So I did that trip with Bob. And then when I came back, I'd had a daughter. When I came back, a friend of mine called me up and said, Rich, I need you to come to London. This, this is going somewhere. <laughs> Trust me. I need you to come to London because I want you to help me out with this show that I'm doing. Now, this is a guy I haven't seen since high school, so it's a little bit of a weird phone call to get. Okay, so he flies me to London. I f go and I pitch this show with him, and we go to all these studio executives, but nothing. There's no show. The guy didn't really have a show. He didn't have money. He didn't have anything. So I felt a little crazy to be there. But as I shook the hand of one of his friends, I heard that voice that we all hear in our head say, this is why you're, in, this is why you're here in London. And this gentleman's name is Robert Beer. He's an Oxford professor. He's a Tibetan painter. He does incredible art. But he's a philosopher and a very interesting cat in his own right. So. When I felt that, I thought, well, I'm going to stay in touch with this guy. So we started emailing each other. And about six months went by, and I thought, well, this is, you know, we are having an interesting relationship between the two of us. But then I got the email. His daughter had died. She was 18 years old. She had a boating accident. He was distraught beyond any place that he could be. So as a friend, I thought, is there anything I can do to help? And then I had been reading Carol Bowman's book. Anybody familiar with that, Children's Past Lives? She studied with Ian Stevenson. And Carol's book is a wonderful book about children who remember past lives. So I sent him a copy of the book. And he wrote me back and said, I'm familiar with this book. Have you read Michael Newton's book? OK, Journey of Souls. I picked up a copy of Journey of Souls, and the first chapter there's a client who discusses a life between lives where they're in a classroom and everyone is dressed in white. So at that moment, I thought, well, that's my signal. If you're going to try to figure out how to get there from the coin flip to the guy to shaking his hand to Michael Newton, there's no clear signal. So I thought, I, I want to interview this guy. Because then I, then I opened up his work and I started reading his books. But anyway, I called him up and I said, uh, listen, I'd love, to, I'd love to do this documentary. And he said, you know how many people have called me up and said that? Everybody. And nobody has ever made one. So why are you different? I said, well, because I'm going to do it. That's why I'm different. And uh, so he agreed to an interview. And it, he said, this is the last interview I will ever give. And it is uh, that he's ever given. And I went to Chicago and I filmed him. But as a journalist, I'd also worked as a journalist and, you know, as a filmmaker, I'm looking for truth, but I'm also wary of mistruth. And I can see it a mile away when someone's acting, when someone's speaking for my benefit because the camera's on. I mean, I could see that. That's something I do. So I interviewed him and his story was very compelling. And then I interviewed his wife because I thought, well, then I can get her to corroborate what he's saying. And I said to her, what did you think about what he was saying when he came home and told you this information about his research? And she said, I thought he was nuts. I thought they were going to take my husband away. She said, until I heard the tapes. All right, so let me tell you what his interview was. And that'll explain why we're here, what the film is about, what the book is about. And Michael Newton was a hypnotherapist in the 50s and 60s in Los Angeles, a psychologist trained. 
and people would send him clients who had psychosomatic illnesses that they couldn't figure out any logical reason to cure. Same way Brian Weiss had that issue as a psychiatrist. And Newton did not believe in past life regression. He thought it was a waste of time. Thought it was just, you know, some kind of version of cryptomnesia, as they call it, where you, you're recalling something you heard, somebody said, some movie. And this client came in, and he had a pain in his shoulder. No, they were going to operate on his shoulder. No one could tell him what it was. And during a session, he quickly went into a previous life where he was a World War I soldier, and he had been bayoneted in a trench in the Battle of the Somme. Newton didn't believe him. So he started grilling this poor guy. Well, really? What's your mother's maiden name? Who's, your, uh, who's in your tent? Uh, what's the name of your commanding officer? What regiment are you in? What corps are you in? That's kind of the way he talks. And he's a relentless guy. And so he relentlessly grilled this poor fellow who gave him all these details. And then after the session was over, the guy said, the pain's gone. And his wife even called him and said, thank you, you saved my husband. But Newton couldn't leave it there, so he contacted the British War Office and said, you got a guy with this name, blah, blah, died in the Battle of the Somme. Yes, he did exist. He was a real person. So from that point, Newton started seeing past life regression. And those people, he started doing his practice that way. So for the next maybe five or ten years, he saw people who would come in and talk about their past lives. And his, like most therapists I've interviewed, their attitude is whether it's real or not, it doesn't really matter because the effect is the same. People are cured of their illness. I'm trying to help people eliminate their problems. But in the 1960s, a woman came in severely depressed who was suicidal, and in her session, she said, quickly, she went into the life between lives, as Newton calls it. And it's where we go after our lifetimes, where we reconnect with people that we've always known. But Newton, again, skeptical, starts to grill her. What is it you're talking about? Where are we? She said, it's now. Newton says, are we in the past? Is this a past life? Is this in the future? He, she says, no, this is now. I'm with my soul group in the life between lives, and I can see them around me, and we've all agreed that we wouldn't be together in this lifetime. Now I'm fine. So when she came out of the session, she said, I'm comfortable now. Now I realize that I'll see them again. Newton said, you know, a skeptic, and now this. And so he closed his practice, and he just started interviewing people that could take him to that place. And for the next 30 years, he interviewed 7,000 people who took him to that place and grilled them about the mechanics of it, where it is, what happens, how many people in your soul group, what color is your energy, what color is their energy? And he mapped all this out, and he didn't publish until 1994. So the people who were coming in didn't, weren't aware of his research. He assiduously avoided bookstores, and his wife corroborated that, so he wouldn't be influenced by a title of a book, which is a pretty unusual trait, if you can imagine, a guy trying to get a book and like, I'm not looking over there. But he did that. And so when he published, he published Journey of Souls. And, and as a, as a you know, psychologist, and also he considers himself a bit of a scientist, he tried to catalog it in a clinical way. And so if you see his book, Journey of Souls, you'll see that's what he's done. And then a few years later, he published Destiny of Souls. And then after that, he published Life Between Lives. And it's a primer for hypnotherapists so that if you're a hypnotherapist or you're a past life regression person and you want to help your clients gain access to this golden place, then he shows you how to do it in that book. And then the last book was called Memories of the Afterlife. And that's an interesting book as well because uh, it's hypnotherapists around the world that he's trained who they tell a story of an amazing patient. And then you interview the patient. So the patient tells you, 
here was my presenting problem. I went in to see him, and then they had this between life session where they were able to solve a number of really deep issues. Okay? Um, all four of those books are wonderful. But back to my journey. So I've interviewed Michael Newton, I've interviewed his wife, and they say, Would you like to film some sessions? Really? You're going to let me film? Yes, I'd love to. These sessions were between hypnotherapists who were learning and hypnotherapists who were trained. Okay, so my first group of people that I saw were people who were aware of Michael Newton's work, very familiar with it, but they had agreed to do a session. And the first session I filmed was, uh, and it's in the book, it's there are transcriptions of these sessions, but the first session was a woman who is a hypnotherapist in Santa Fe. I interviewed her afterwards and I said, had you ever had this past life memory before? No, she'd never had it. She did a public demonstration, a room about this size. Paul Orend, who's a hypnotherapist in New York, conducted the session. Michael Newton sat behind and a white whiteboard would write notes like, notice how he repeats the question. Notice how he repeats her answers to help the client sort of build the case of what they're saying. And the reason I bring it up is because it blew my mind. So I'm sitting there with my camera, like still the journalist, still trying to figure out whether this is all accurate. I've heard Michael Newton's point of view. But now I'm filming my first session. And this woman quickly goes into, we go through her life. That's the first half hour is sort of a relaxing and deepening part where then you go into a place where you can answer questions. And so the question is, what point did you, what month did you arrive here in the body of this person? And she answered it, you know, it's always after the fourth month. Then they ask, so let's go to a previous lifetime that has some significance on this lifetime. It's kind of a generic question. She said, I'm in Auschwitz. I'm in a gas chamber, I'm naked, my head's been shaved, I'm huddling with these other women, we're supposed to get showers, but we kind of know that's not going to happen. Now, as a filmmaker, I couldn't help but think, how convenient for her to have this memory for me and my camera. And I couldn't help but think, is she doing this for my benefit? You see? Because I couldn't get my mind around, because it was... It was too dramatic of a story. Anyway, so then she went back into this person's life, because that's what they do. They say, hold on to, from where we are. Let's pause that. Let's move back to a happier time in this person's life. Anna Paczynski from Warsaw. She had a family. Her son's father's name was Joseph. Her, her mother's name was Anna as well. She had so many kids, etc., etc. All details I was able to verify through a search of records in Auschwitz. But she then talks about a happier time in her life and being rounded up and going to the concentration camp and then dying. And the hypnotherapist says, now where are you? And she said, I've, you know, I'm going home. And I've found many people say that. I'm going home now. So she gets back home and she's greeted by her spirit guide, as everyone in these sessions are. And the spirit guide, male or female, she recognizes this person instantly because she's seen this person between every lifetime. And that person then takes her sometimes to a place of healing where you regenerate your energy. Sometimes they'll go to the Akashic Records place, Library of Souls, to see how they chose to be there. They almost always see and visit with their soul group. Soul groups are anywhere from 3 to 25 individuals and the average is 15. And if, and if you were going to think of your own lifetime, who's in my soul group? It's a great question. Just think of the people you've met who you felt like you've always known. And sometimes, it's, and many times, there's a person in your soul group, when you see this soul group, that's the last person you, because that was the stone in your path. That was the person who, who you felt had pushed you in the wrong direction but then you see that it was an agreement that you made with that person. That happens quite frequently. But in this woman's case, 
She eventually goes to the Council of Elders. That's another place people go. They call it the Council of Elders. You could call it whatever, wisdom makers. But it's generally six to 12 individuals who help you do a life review. So in your death experiences, you talk about a life review. Sometimes it's almost like you're skipping down to this part of this journey. So in this life review, you can ask any question, why, how, what did I do this for? And she asked the question, why did I choose such a difficult life? This was so hard for me. I lost everyone I love. And her counsel said, well, we'll show you. And she said, they're showing me images. This is going to be hard to hear, but they're showing me images that it was harder to play the role of a perpetrator in this life than a victim. When I heard that sentence, I literally stepped back from my camera and looked around the room like, what? Easily the most politically incorrect thing I've ever heard in my life. What? It was harder to play the role of a Nazi than a victim. It was a new piece of information to me and took me, and then she elaborated. She talked about how every day were lessons in compassion. Every day of this difficult life were lessons in loyalty and honor. But that between lives, when we go back there to home, we're back to our natural state where we don't carry any of that with us. That's a reframe. I, as I heard it, I realized this is, this is qu contrary to everything I've ever heard. So I went away from that session thinking, okay, that, now I've taken the red pill, as they say in that movie, <laughs> Matrix. You know, uh-oh, do I really want to know this information? And then, so I continued to film it. And this next person I filmed was a hypnotherapist who had a aquaphobia, severe aquaphobia. She couldn't go in the water. And I, I had met her before the session. I subsequently had become friends with her, but I didn't know her at the time, really. And uh, she's doing the session with a trained hypnotherapist, and she suddenly is choking in the water. She's drowning, and ab reaction is what they call it, and the trained hypnotherapist can help them. But she was choking and gasping and turning blue, basically. I thought, you know, should I stop the camera and help her? Like, what are we doing here? But, you know, he helped her through this. And what she was seeing was she was an Irish, she was an Irish sailor in 1882 on a ship called the Landsmann. It was a German ship, and they had shoved her off into the dark water. They had murdered her, thrown her off the ship. And she can see the captain looking over the bow and smiling, and she's furious. And she's swearing, I mean, you know, like a sailor, <laughs> and saying, they killed me. They pushed me in here. How dare they? And I, they're smiling and they're enjoying this. Therapist, you know, calms her down and eventually brings her up. Let's rise above this. Where would you like to go? I want to go home. When she gets back there, she sees the captain of the ship come out of a mist and he's holding her hand and he's saying, you have no idea how hard it was to do that to you in this lifetime. Then she says, I recognize him. He's my father in this life who saved her from drowning when she was three years old, but wasn't aware of it until this moment. She knew she had been thrown, like fallen off of something, a, a lake and been saved. But now she saw the whole event. So in that one moment, she sort of was able to forgive all of that. And then she said, oh, I see, I was a bad comrade. I was, the ship had run aground, and I was stealing food from everyone, and they had voted to throw me off. Now she saw that refrain, no longer angry at the people who had killed her because she saw that she deserved it. The therapist said, is there any other lifetimes that you've had this drowning issue? And then she named a few. And he said, can we work on uh, releasing that stuff? And so by the time she was done with that session, her aquaphobia was gone. I filmed her swimming not long after that. So 
the therapy itself, again, can be a wonderful thing just to, to help people. But back to my story. So now I'm in this conference, I'm filming these people. I just, I keep filming people. Wow, this is great. They let me film a whole bunch of people. Every, each one different lessons, each one different stories, each one stuff that I can verify, stuff that I can look up online, because now we have the internet. We can really find forensic evidence of just about everything. So it's confirming that part of it, but it's the between life where now I'm hearing information that's really fascinating about the journey about what happens there. And they're confirming it each time. And then they say, how about you? Would you like to try? Would you like to do a session? Me? OK. So on the last day of the conference, I did my own four-hour session. And the jaded journalist, I sat there. I am not going to see anything unless I see it. I am not going to say I see anything. I'm not going to let, in fact, bless you, in, in fact, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put in trick questions so that the therapist, I can prove the therapist isn't lying. So my trick question was, what's the meaning of vanum populatum? And vanum populatum is a Latin phrase that it came to me. Oh, thank you, Cheryl. Cheryl, I have a hand for Cheryl, thank you, Cheryl. Okay, I'm an addict. I, I, I admit it. The reason I'm here today is to talk to you about caffeine addiction. <laughs> so, um, where was I? Help me. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Someone's listening. All right, so I was in my apartment in Santa Monica about six months before I even picked up the first book about Newton. And you know how you're, you're waking up and you hear a voice? We've all done that. You know, sometimes it's somebody calling your name. Hey, wake up, you know, or, or whatever it is, some sound. Well, in my case, I heard someone say, Vanum Populatum. And I thought, what the? So I wrote it down. Is that Latin? I, I never took Latin. I speak Italian, but I don't speak Latin. Vanum Populatum. Okay. Well, you know, a week went by. Forgot about it. Walked by, oh, right, there's that phrase. Okay, well, I'll go look it up. Bonum. Well, it does mean in Latin, it means vanity. Interesting. Populatum. What does that mean? What? To annihilate completely, to utterly destroy, to wipe off the face of the earth. <laughs> Whoever came up with populatum as a word, I mean, they were pretty angry about it. But I'm thinking, wait a second, annihilate vanity. I live in Los Angeles. Where do I begin? <laughs> you know, am I the guy who's supposed to go out and annihilate vanity? I'm here to annihilate your vanity. <laughs> but then as I thought about it, like who is talking to me and saying annihilate vanity? I realized there was something about it was me talking to me. Why would I talk to myself in a language I don't speak? Then I thought, well, maybe it's because I was a, a Roman at some point, and that guy's talking to this guy. I mean, that's possible. But then that didn't make any sense either. You know, if I know me, why wouldn't I talk? So, okay, Vana Popula on me. Oh, wait a second, annihilate vanity. That's, that's a Zen Buddhist phrase, destroy the ego. But because I've studied Tibetan philosophy and Buddhist philosophy, I know that that, that concept of destroying the self the things of the self is not about destroying yourself, but it's destroying the things that we think are self, that aren't really a relative self. So annihilating vanity then becomes annihilate cars and money and fame, the things that drive People magazine. Annihilate these things, not just ignore them, annihilate them, wipe it off the face of the earth. Wow. That's what I got out of that. So now I'm about to do my session. I thought, okay, I got the great question. What's von, what's von and Populata mean? Because if the Council of Elders doesn't know, then we're in trouble, right? This is all nonsense. And, you know, also, I'm like anybody else. I can't be hypnotized. My brain is going so fast. I just, but I'll try it. 
And so now we do the session. And uh, the guy who did my session, his name is Jimmy Quast. Highly recommend him. He's over in Maryland. He's in Easton, Maryland. So if you're ever interested in doing this kind of between life therapy, he's good. He says, and we go through my lifetime. We go back to when I was a kid. He says, let's go to an incident when you were about 10 or 11. And I see myself cutting this finger with an ax. And I see the blood coming down and running. running. And I feel the emotion of being a 10-year-old, you know, cutting your hand like a little kid. Like, ah, what have I done? And then to see my father, who had subsequently passed away, you know, come out of the garage with bandages and everything. <gasps> Dad's here. Dad's going to save me. And the emotion of it. I felt it. So I thought, well, this is interesting. I'm accessing that part of my brain that retains all that emotion. Great. That's cool. Then he says, let's go to your first memory. And I gasp. And I'm being born. I say, I'm being born. And I see, you know, bright, bright light and cold and a metal table. And then this doctor's face, as clear as I can see your face, hazel eyes. You know, the little metal thing they used to wear back in the 50s, <laughs> uh, 55. And, you know, his face covered. And he's looking at me. And now I, but I was also aware that he was doing this. So he was holding me upside down. But I'm looking at him this way. So, and I said, um, my father's not here, but he's on his way here. Now, I didn't know that as a detail until I asked my mom after the session. Called her up, Mom, where was Dad when I was born? He was driving on the way to the hospital. Okay, all right. Small confirmation. So now we go, he says, what time, what month did you show up in, in your body? And I'm thinking to myself, why don't I just say, I don't know. I couldn't possibly know that. How could I? I'm not. And I say, fourth month. Okay. And that's part of the routine, which is just say whatever comes into your mind. Don't edit it. Uh, so I'm trying that. That's, you know, I take direction well. So now he says, well, now we're going to go to a previous life that has some significance on this life. And I just see blackness, blackness, blackness. I got my eyes closed. Everything's black. What do you see? Nothing. You see anything now? Nope. Black, 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 black. Not a thing. I don't see a thing. And he says, well, just look down. And that act of forcing me to do another perspective, I look down and I see my naked feet in a stream of water. And they're all cut up and kind of bloody. I've been running. That's interesting. Now we pull back and I see buckskin. And I see long black hair and feathers in it. And I laugh. I go, I'm an American Indian, I think. And he says, uh, where are we? I say, well, I'm out in this kind of field. I've come here. I'm a medicine man. I was trying to get herbs for a battle that was coming up, and the battle happened, and I had to run, so I'm here. He said, can we go visit your tribe? He said, no, we can't. I don't want to do that. And as I'm saying, I'm thinking, why wouldn't I want to do that? He said, okay, what's your name? And I said, it sounds like Tatanka. Now, I saw Dances with Wolves. Tatanka means buffalo in Lakota Sioux. And I'm thinking, oh, that's funny. I'm making this up. <laughs> but I can't say buffalo. So I say Tatanka. And then I say, well, it's not Tatanka, it's Watanka. <coughs> Sounds like Watanka. And then I'm thinking, what, you can't even say Tatanka? <laughs> you know, you have to add it, make it different? <laughs> so, you know, your conscious mind is always arguing with you. But you're, you're, the, the, the precondition is to just speak. And so now he says, let's go see your tribe. And I go and I see a crowd of dead bodies, everyone killed. And I actually go to a teepee, very tall thing, and I open it up, and I see a woman with black hair, lying on the ground and her throat's been cut. And I say, ah, they've killed my wife, they've taken my son. Now, I say it like that. I'm fully in that emotion of that. My son's not, there's no boy around. But I'm saying it as I'm experiencing it. So I feel the emotion of that. The trauma of that sentence is going through me. And I can't help but think, why am I reliving that moment? If I'm making it up, you know, wouldn't I just say it? But I'm reliving it, and it's traumatic. And he said, who did this? And I said, God damn, Huron. And as I said that, I went, Huron, Sue, wait a minute. Huron, upstate New York, 
I mean, I did my geography. The sewer in Montana. I, I, I must be making this up. So I just, you know, I just keep speaking. And then he goes, let's go to the last day of your life. Now I'm going to pause here for one second to say, on the last day of my life, I, was, I drank a bottle of whiskey and walked into the Mississippi and just let myself drown, just bobbed like a cork. And the hypnotherapist said, you know, are you okay? Is this, are you just sad? You're feeling sad? I said, I just want to go home. They took everything from me. They took my people. They took my pride. They took my religion. I went on like that, you know, like a, like a fiery preacher. They took everything from me. I'm a shell. I can't wait to go home. Wow. And as I'm saying it, I'm thinking, who's this guy? You know, dramatic guy. But I just want to pause for a second because we may not get back to it, but about a year after that, I was in uh, at a funeral in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And one of my relatives died, my great, wonderful aunt. And as I'm at the funeral afterwards, I'm sitting next to a guy who's like a second cousin. And he says, I said, what are you doing these days? He said, well, I, I'm a Lakota Sioux historian. You're kidding me. He, I, he said, I know everything about the Lakota Sioux. I've actually been admitted into the tribe. <laughs> okay, I got a story for you. I had this vision. And he said, oh, 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 just don't tell me anything about your vision. Just tell me. What were you wearing? And I said, I was wearing buckskin. He said, how many feathers did you have? I said, two. He said, were they up or were they down? He actually did that up. <laughs> you know, and I saw that, you know, up thing. And uh, I said, no, they were down. They were in my hair. He said, well, that means you were a medicine man. Really? Well, I said my name was Watanka. He said, well, that, that is what they call a medicine man. It means the great spirit. Wakantanka is the great spirit. People who worked for Wakantanka were Watankas. Wow, that was a confirmation. And I couldn't find it online, because Watanka is the derivation of Wakantanka. And then I said, well, hold on, wait a minute. What about this reference about the Huron? And he said, you're sitting where they fought for 60 years. Eau Claire, Wisconsin. OK, those details I could not confirm independently, and they were confirmed for me by somebody else. So OK, I can stop saying I made that up. I can just say it is what it is. So now. They say, let's go into the life between, he doesn't say that. He says, where would you like to go? After my bobbing like a cork down the river. And I say, I want to go home. And out of my field of view, and I'm just sharing this with you guys because I know, you know how much you guys know about near-death experience, and you'll see the similarities. But I see out of this mist about 20 individuals, and out of the center of the mist comes a fellow who I recognize as my teacher, the guy I've been with for all my lives. But he greets me in a different way than anything I've ever read or seen or heard. He acts like we're old pals. Hey, how you doing? You okay? Yeah. Do you want to go anywhere? I, I expected him to go, you know, come, we'll see, we'll look. I think I should go to the healing center, don't you? He goes, yeah, let's go. So I go to the center where I see myself in like a bank of lights just pulling energy in and reconstituting my inner etheric self full of energy, where would you like to go now? And I say, I'd like to go to a classroom. No, I say, I want to go see my soul group. And I'm in a classroom. And I'm in a classroom, like regular classroom. It's like I'm at the back door. The students are all facing this way. And there's a teacher up at the front. And as I walk in, I start saying, oh, there's my friend Kajira. Oh, she teaches this class. This is fantastic. Hypnotherapist says, do you know Kajira? She says, I do. What's this class about? Oh, it's about energy reconstruction. This is where people come to get their energy reconstructed. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I think I can. Well, let me tell you. Here's how it works. Basically, we travel through all of our lifetimes with fractals or geometric shapes that travel, and they carry all the emotional information that we've had from all of our lifetimes. I'm talking like this in this complete knowledgeable way that is rich is going, who's this guy? And when I transcribe it, I have to like back it up. Like, what? Trans? What? Fractals? What's a fractal? And then I found that in other sessions that I filmed, everybody talked about these fractals, these geometric shapes that orbs may be what we're talking about. They travel with us through all of our lifetimes. They retain the emotional information energetically of all the lifetimes. And I say, we use them as ball bearings to get through life. 
And he says, can you describe what that means? And I said, well, how does a ball bearing work? It works in a machine. And it smooths things over so other things can work. I said, however, while you're in your lifetime, you start picking up negative energy and negative stuff, junk. You got to clean your fractal. You got to bring your stuff back and clean it up. And this is a classroom where they teach how to clean those things up. And when, if you stick around for the movie, you'll see I, I got some footage of ball bearings being cleaned, you know, so you can sort of see what that process is. But like I say, you know, I'm not aware of who this guy is who's talking, but it's me, and it's a guy who has a bigger brain than I do. And then the hypnotherapist, or the, uh, the soul guide says, where, the spirit guide says, where would you like to go now? And I go, Luana. Boom, I'm in her classroom. Everybody's dressed in white. She's sitting in the last row. She's about 21 years old. Blonde hair, ponytail. She looks up. She sees me. She goes, like, what are you doing here? And I'm talking to the hypnotherapist, and I've entered her class. But what's interesting to me is the first class, all the students turned and looked like, oh, there's teacher's friend. This is exciting. Oh, look, they're talking to each other. This is kind of fun. The class were like young souls. This class, older souls. And not amused that somebody has walked into their classroom in the middle of a class. And the teacher is not amused, but that doesn't stop me. <laughs> because I go, well, the teacher is like really a deep guy. His name is Tethra, and I can see he's sort of a, he said, describe him. I said, well, he's kind of uh, androgynous. He's male and female, but his energy is mostly male, and he's green. He's got a real green glow to him. And I say, and this is a healing class where they teach how to heal people on the planet. They teach the doctors on the planet Earth to channel the healing light of the universe into a client when they're doing an operation, or let's say, or some other healing process. And one of the students turns to me and goes, you don't know what you're talking about. And I thought, well, this is weird. If I'm making this up, why am I mocking myself? <laughs> and I say, well, I'm being you know, admonished here for my explanation, which isn't very deep. I say, because, listen, there's all kinds of things involved a person might have signed up to experience an illness in this lifetime. So that's going to make it very difficult for the doctor to change that. And the doctor may have signed up not to help this person in this lifetime. So there's that in the mix. There's quite a number of complications that can occur. But they're teaching this healing energy class. Wow. So now we go to the Council of Elders. I say goodbye to Luana. She's like, are you on TV? Are you doing a talk show? That's what she says. No, no, I'll be back. I'll see you later. So now I go into the Council of Elders, and I see eight individuals in front of me, male, female, different. I name them all. One person speaks, the spokesperson. And he says, you know, and they're all, they all seem really excited to see me. They, they know me. And I have this impression that I'm right, like, you know, exactly where I am now, really. I was behind some kind of a podium. And I, can, and I feel the buzz in a room, and it reminded me when I used to be on, in plays and stuff. Just before the opening curtain goes up, there's a buzz, you know, a feeling of like, oh, anticipation. And I said it, you know, this is weird, I'm experiencing this. So, the, so now the hypnotherapist says, you want to ask these questions to your council of elders? Yeah, let's ask them. What's the meaning of monopopulatum? And they all erupt with laughter. They laugh. What's the meaning of they? Monopopulatum, oh, that's hysterical. And the lead council guy looks at me and he goes, why don't you ask Rich that question? He knows the answer. And as he says that, an image of me appears lying on the couch where I'm talking to the hypnotherapist. And in that moment, I realized that he's saying, he's referring to the eternal rich, Rama, as he called me. He's referring to that guy as the temporary rich, you know, the guy who's on the planet now. Ask him, otherwise he would have said, you already know the answer to that. He didn't say that. He said, he knows the answer to that. Ask him. Then they all laughed. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> the other thing I got from that is that that self that is a fixed, not fixed, because we're always going from lifetime to lifetime. We change colors, we get older, we do all this stuff. 
that's not a fixed entity, but that is a different entity or another part of me, let's call it. And by the way, they say that we bring about a third of our energy into this lifetime. Two-thirds stays behind. And that's a question in all the sessions where they go, how much of your energy did you bring to this lifetime? And people say, uh, 20%, 28%. I always think, why do they answer the question? Why don't they go, how can I know? But they always say, you know, a percentage. Um, I think I said 28. But it's about a third. Two-thirds of your energy is always between lives keeping an eye on you, watching you. So when you're praying to someone for help, solace, deliverance, throw yourself into the prayer. Don't ignore yourself. Because when you're saying, oh, you know, help me, please. Aunt Betty, I need the lottery numbers. But, you know, throw yourself. Rich, you know, I really, you know, I don't know. I, and there's probably a plan for why this is going this way. But if you could just help me see that plan, I'd really appreciate it. So I got to the final question. I had asked a number of very, very interesting and unusual questions, as you can imagine. I'd laid them out the night before. I thought, well, if I'm going to talk to God, I'm going to ask some deep stuff. So I asked a bunch of questions. But the most one that's relevant to us today is I said, so why did I choose me? Why did I choose Rich Martini? Because that's really kind of a burning question for all of us. Why do we choose our, if this is true, we choose our parents, we choose our lifetimes. We work together with our soul group to agree on who we're going to be. We even work out the stones that are going to be in our path so we can overcome them, so we can learn something from them spiritually. If this is all true, and this is what everybody says, then why me? And I said, every thought, action, word, or deed contains energy. Every time you paint a painting, sing a song, write an email. Compose anything. It carries your energy, your intent, but also energy. And you can heal people with that energy. You can change people's lives. You can use words to reach into somebody's heart and open it. In my case, I chose being a filmmaker. Because one belly laugh in a theater can change a person's disposition. Then I said... Tears work, but you have to go through catharsis to get to it. Now, catharsis isn't a word I think I've ever used, except maybe in a class somewhere. But you use catharsis to get to the same place that a belly laugh will take you. Healing can happen with images, with music, we know, with music, all that stuff. And I chose Rich Martini in this, and I said it, outside the box, and I saw myself in the life planning session pitching my case for that, because this guy is going to be able to use film to heal people. And then I paused and said, thinking about my career, because you guys have never heard of me, and I've been working at this for 20 years. I said, he's just not very good at it. And I got this huge laugh from the council. They all laughed. I said, you know, but, and so did the hypnotherapist. He laughed too. So I was getting laughs on two planes simultaneously. That was strange. <laughs> I said, but I think that's about to change. And so then the way the session ends is you sort of say goodbye to everyone. I saw my father. I went by. I kissed him on the forehead. As I know what my dad's forehead feels like, you know, and whatever happened there, I kissed him on the forehead. He looked me in the eye and said, get back to work. So then I, get, I got back to work. And I wrote to Robert Beer, and I said, Robert, I have had the most profound experience with Michael Newton's work. I think you really have an opportunity. Your daughter had died. If you want to see your daughter again, this is a way to do it. And he said, yeah, I'm going to do that. And so he organized a, a meeting with a Newton-trained hypnotherapist in London. And by the way, he went to a number of psychics in London and famous ones because he knows them in his Oxford circles, and none of them could help him for whatever reason. They just said, we try to access your daughter, and we can't get there for some reason. But in the session that he did, he spent an hour with his daughter. And like I say, he knows what his daughter looks like, sounds like, feels like. It's not someone else telling him, you're with your daughter now. It's you, with your daughter, holding her hand, 
She says, Dad, your head's in the books too much. Can I tell you, we've had a number of lifetimes where you do that, and she showed them to him. She was one of his spirit guides. She showed him all their journeys together, and, he said, she showed him his manner of death in this lifetime. Something most of us don't want to know. But for whatever reason, she wanted to show that to him. But his past life review, which I thought was really interesting and it kind of uh, puts a, something in, in the column of proof. He remembered a past life in Boston in 1840. He was a banker. He lived off the Boston Common. Now, this is a guy who's never been to Boston, but I went to school there at BU, so I know the Boston Common. And what he described was the way the Common looked back in 1840. I knew that. But in that memory, he was married to a woman that he knows from this life. Okay? Girl that he used to date back in the 1960s. In 1840, he was married to her, and it was the love of his life. Let's call her Elizabeth. And Elizabeth died. And that ruined his life, and he became an al alcoholic, and he died. Okay, that's his memory. And he wrote to me that all in this email. And so I said, Robert, here's a wonderful opportunity for us to prove whether this is true or not. Are you friends with Elizabeth? Yeah. Don't tell her anything about your session. I'll, well, she lives in Boston. I'll arrange, I'll choose the hypnotherapist, and we'll do a session with her and see what she remembers. So I arranged for her to go down from Boston. You know, Robert called her up and said, oh, you know, there's a friend of mine. He really wants to do this thing. I think it'll be really great for you. Why don't you try it out? She goes to New York City. She does the past life re regression with Paul Orend. Who I set up that, and she had the identical past life memory, being married to Robert Beer in 1840. There are no odds for that. As far as science is concerned, that's a confirmation of previous life existence. Okay? So I thought that was a wonderful case that I could include. But after this journey, after my session, I walked away from that conference going, what do I do with this information? And I went off to work on the movie Salt, <laughs> the Angelina Jolie film. And I spent a year doing that. And, you know, I started, I was working late, late hours, and I started wondering, why am I doing this? This is so hard work. I'm not filming it. I'm just working for the director. I spend every day in Angelina Jolie's trailer. That's nice. She's got great food, very good water. But, you know, it's not my journey. And at some point, I had a vision, and I saw these kids in Cambodia uh, eating soup. And then I thought, oh, I see. I'm working overtime so she can make $20 million so that these kids, that she owns an orphanage in Cambodia, so these kids can be healed. That's a little bit of a far stretch for me, because I got kids back in Santa Monica, who I'll refer to in a minute, but that wasn't enough for me. But the next day I had another vision. And that vision, you know, you're waking up, you see it, but it was a kid in Bombay, in Mumbai, in an alley, selling an illegal copy of Salt. Movie wasn't finished yet, but there was Angie's picture, you know, Salt. And the kid was selling it to a tourist for 40 rupees. And then he took the 40 rupees and he turned and he gave it to his wife, who was living in a box with four kids. And if you've ever been to India, that's really common. And in that moment, I saw the wheel work. The quantum butterfly effect of how all of you have done this in your lifetime and you can't see it. The overtime, the making Angelina happy, making the director happy, spending that time doing all that stuff is all part of the big painting that is the energy, the wheel work of helping people somewhere on the planet. That overtime directly, and that's why it was an illegal, illegal copy because no money went to anybody back here. But my work, my energy, went into the product. So my point is that's all of us have that. You can't see where you've helped somebody across the street. You've done something for somebody 
You've written them a letter. You've put your arm around them. And this comes out in all of Newton's cases. People doing past life reviews, they'll say, they'll go into the past life review thinking, oh, I'm going to be judged. And then when they get in there, the council never judges. They always just show you what you've learned. And in this case, I remember there was one case where a guy remembered a lifetime in the 1930s, depression, and, and he was there and the council saying, well, I donated to a lot of charities. And they said, no, 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 we're not interested in your donation. We're interested in that moment where you took a woman off the street and you put your arm around her and you walked her onto a bus. She was suicidal and you said, everything's going to be okay. And you paid for her lunch. That was the big moment in your life. And he was startled. <laughs> what? I had many other things to do. That's the moment you're picking out of my life? But that's, that's the journey and that's the energy. So I went back and, and started uh, filming people who didn't know Newton, who never heard of Michael Newton, people who were skeptics, people, friends of mine in the entertainment industry who didn't believe a word I was saying, who said, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm doing it in my office in Beverly Hills. You can bring your camera up and film me. Okay. Another executive, we're going to go to my house. We're going to do it in my house. And, you know, I'm not going to say anything I don't see. Okay, that's fine. Another executive said, or another woman uh, film producer said, I don't believe a word you're saying, but I'm having an operation in a week, and so if I can talk to my subconscious, I'll do it. All I can tell you is every single one of them had the same journey. They all had a past life regression. They all went to their, at some point, soul group, spirit guide, council of elders, understood why they chose this lifetime. It's not, just, it's not just that you chose a past life and you chose this life. You've had many past lives. Why did this one come up in a session? That's key. Why did you choose that past life? So it's one thing to remember you died in the Titanic, but it's another thing to know why you chose a life where you knew you were going to die in the Titanic and why you chose this life and what the two have in common. It's like a deeper, deeper, deeper way of examining what we're doing on the planet. So, when my son was two, RJ is his name, he called me on the phone. I was in Chicago visiting my mom. First time he's ever talked to me on the phone. He's two years old. I'd said, love you. Dad. Yeah? I was a monk in Nepal. That's what I did. And I said, put your mother on the phone. <laughs> What the, what's, what's going on there? What are you guys, are you watching some? No, I don't know why he said that. It just came out of nowhere. I, I don't know what, what happened. What, what's going on? I, I don't know, I don't know. Okay, all right, well, that's weird. Monk in Nepal, you know. And then I'd ask him about it, and he'd say, like, you know, SpongeBob. So a year after that, I was with the car, I was in the car with him in Santa Monica, and we're driving around. And I, friends of mine who have little kids, I mean, I started late, as you can see. But friends of mine who have little kids, he's seven now. I say, Ask your kids, simple question, did you choose mom and dad or did they choose you? And the answers are really interesting. Uh, so far it's been 50-50. Half go, what are you, nuts? What is that, a trick question? And the other half go, I chose mom and dad and here's why. Because I knew they were going to get divorced and I had to help mom get through that. You know, from a kid's point of view. All right. And now I'm going to do one little aside here, forgive me, but while I was working on Salt, and by the way, the, there was an actor on Salt who kept saying, you know, this documentary you're talking about, it's a book. <laughs> you know, stop working on the documentary, make the book. And that's what I did. And then I, once I was done with the book, I realized, oh, no, I can finish the documentary now. So that's what I did. That's how the process went. I shot the footage, wrote the book, then went back to it. But while we're working on Salt, I'm telling this actor about my research. I'll tell you her story, actually. This woman, she had a call out of nowhere from John Edwards. You know John Edward, okay? He said to her, do you know who I am? And she said, no, I don't know who you are. And he said, well, your father has been coming through in sessions I've been having, and I need, I, I think he wants to talk to you. <laughs> she said, she, she told me that no one knew that her father had committed suicide when she was a little girl. No one even knew that her father was alive or dead. It wasn't part of her resume or any of that stuff. So she thought he was hitting on her. 
like a pretty, pretty young actress. And so she took her boyfriend to John Edwards' office, just in case. And uh, so now they go into the session, and John says, your father's coming through very clearly. He wants you to call your mother. So she picks up the phone and calls her mother in Michigan. Mom answers the phone. Mom, I'm with John. Ed oh, my gosh, John Edwards, you're with him. I know him. I watch his show. Well, they're also here with Dad. Oh, okay. Um, and Dad wants you to go downstairs and find a red book. So the mom goes downstairs, and she's looking, and John Edwards is saying, not that room. He's saying, keep going to the end of the hall. Now get on a chair. Up on the shelf, there's a red folder. He, she pulls down the red. You've never heard the story because she never told it to anybody. Opens the red folder, and there's pictures of the dad. Happy, carefree, in love, a wonderful father. And the father says, that's how he is now, and he wants you to remember him that way. And he sends his love. And he says, oh, and by the way, you should marry your boyfriend because you're pregnant. You're pregnant. So he told her you're pregnant. She did not know that, and she did marry the boyfriend, and she was working on salt with her baby. So while I'm talking to this actress about this stuff, you know, I'm saying, well, this is a little bit like my book. Um, this New York detective tough cop, pulls me aside. Martini, come here, can I talk to you? Yeah, oh, sure. He takes me into a room, he closes the door, locks it. I want to talk to you about possession. What? I think my house is possessed. Okay, well, why is that? Well, my daughter, she's, I won't do the accent, no, but she, my daughter's eight years old and she sees a cop. She sees a cop in my kitchen who's dead. It's freaking me out. And then the other day she comes and says that she died in Australia. So I said, well, hold on a second. First, let's, let's examine that you're talking to a Guido on a movie set. Okay, let's start there. But in my research, let's just separate the issues. Who's the, who's the ghost? He says, well, that's weird because... Uh, she said he looks like a cop. She saw him every morning in the kitchen, and finally he pulled out a picture of his partner who had died 10 years ago before she was born. But it was a picture of him like at age 50. And the little girl said, that's him, Dad, but he's younger now. So she was seeing a younger version of the cop, okay, dressed like a cop. And I said, well, in the research, People between lives can appear as they want. You want to appear as a younger man, or you usually appear as the person you're most healthy as. So that makes sense. And let me ask you, do you like this guy? He said, no, I loved him. I said, well, then is it so bad that your old partner that you loved is hanging around your house and keeping an eye on you? He said, no, that's okay. All right, I, I get that. He said, well, what about the, the reincarnation stuff? And I said, well, um... In my experience and what I've read, when you ask a child to remember a past life or they're remembering a past life, if they're making it up, the details are all over the map. However, if they're remembering something, it's consistent. So why don't you take out a map of Australia and ask her? Now, most parents aren't used to doing that, you know, saying, I don't know the answer to what we're about to examine. I'm asking you and you might know the answer. So this little girl looks at the map of Australia, points to Perth, and says, I was a farmer, my wife and I lived there, and our whole family died in a drought in like 1820. And then she burst into tears. And then it was gone. It was like she was waiting to tell her dad, and he listened. So they had that experience, because the next day he comes in, and he locks the door again. He's, you're not going to believe it. She said she was from Perth and blah, blah, blah. So that's a predicate for what I'm about to say. So now my two-year-old son has said, Dad, I was a monk in Nepal. So he's talking to the right guy. It's not like I'm going to say, no, you weren't. <laughs> so it's a year later. He's three, and we're driving around Santa Monica, and he's in the back seat in his little, you know, baby seat. And uh, my wife and daughter are out of the car. And I look at him and I go, so did you know dad from before? He said, yeah. I said, where did you meet me? 
He said, too bad. I looked at him and said, to Tibet? Where in Tibet? He said, on the path. Did he mean philosophical path? <laughs> you know, now I'm thinking I'm back in Thurman's class where I don't understand what you're talking about. Philos or the path. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Mount Kailash. There's a path. It's the most sacred path in the world. There's a spot on that path where you make a wish, it'll come true. Thurman told me. I was there. He said, on this spot, if you make a wish, it'll come true. I said, all right, I want a million, no. I want a three-picture deal. No, I want a million. So I went back and forth, a million dollars, three-picture deal. I couldn't, I mean, you know, that's a Hollywood thing to want, my career. And I really was going to say, okay, I'm now going to say whichever it is, and whatever comes out of my mouth, that's the thing. I want a son. What? I said it. I heard it. I thought, what? Who said that? Then I also thought, oh, you know, I'm a guy. I had a daughter. It must be like a genetic thing. And I dismissed it. But now I'm back in the car with them in Santa Monica. And I say, ah, do you mean Mount Kailash? And he says, no. Oh, OK. There's a lot of paths in Tibet. But then I remembered he's very specific. So I said, do you mean Kangra? And he said, yes, Kangra. <coughs> Just like that. Kangra is the name of the path that goes around Kailash in Tibetan. But I said it, he repeated it, but he repeated it like he was agreeing with me. Yeah, Kangra. Now, a year after that, I'm on salt. I'm working on the movie, my long hours, whining about being in Angie's trailer. My wife and kids are at the sublet that I'm having in the village. And at some point, RJ goes to the library of this guy's apartment and pulls two books out. He's four. He takes one book and he throws it in the trash. And my wife says, what are you doing? And he says, that book is worthless. This is the important one. And it's Robert Thurman's book. I got to step on that. Robert Thurman's book, Circling the Sacred Mountain, which he published in 96, about his first trip around Mount Kailash. My son opens it up to a photograph of the north face of Kailash and says, that's where I found Daddy. So my wife called me. Were you showing him this book? What book? I didn't know the guy had a copy of it. I know that I never said Kailash to him except the one time. And she didn't say Kailash, and he doesn't read. He's looking at a photograph except that one time in the car. He's five, a year after that, and we're in a shop in Topanga Canyon in California. And it's a Bhutanese shop, and the guy who runs it is a Tibetan, and we're chatting. And I had helped the Oracle of Tibet. He's a friend of mine. He's the, he prays for the long life of the Dalai Lama every day, the Nature and Monks. I made a CD with them. I should have brought some. But the CD is, uh, is Prayers for the Long Life of the Dalai Lama. And it's a wonderful CD that you can find everywhere online. But I had given it to this store owner, and he was playing it. And at some point, my son disappeared. So my wife comes out and says, where's RJ? And I said, I, I haven't seen him. It's a small store. He can't be far. She comes back about five minutes later. So the look on her face, if I had a camera, she had gone into the back room, and he was standing in front of a mirror doing full prostrations, top of the head, crown of your head, wisdom, your lip, your heart, all the way down to the ground, all the way back up again, just doing it over and over again. Now, I've never seen, I've seen it in Tibet, I've seen it in India, I've seen it. He's never seen it. But he's doing that, and he sees my wife in the mirror, and he goes, oh, mom, you need to meditate more, and this is how you do it. And he pulls her down to the ground. He's trying to show her. And he says, you hear, the, you hear the music? You hear those bells? Every time you hear a Tibetan bell, it means there's going to be peace somewhere in the world. Now, she tells me this. And then I asked a friend, a Tibetan monk. I said, what does it mean? I thought bells meant wisdom. I said, what does it mean when you hear a bell in Tibetan music? And he said, peace somewhere in the world. 
<laughs> okay. Last October, um, my mom was about to pass away. Concert pianist, she played the piano every day of her life. She raced right up to the last day. But I got a call from my friend who was her caregiver and said, you know, she's going to be gone this weekend, so you better come home. So I sat my kids down, Olivia and RJ, and I said, guys, you know, I'm going to go back, and the next time you see Grandma, she's going to be in a coffin, so I just want to prepare you. It's not going to be Grandma, but she's not going to be there anymore. And he said, he said, um, it's okay, Dad. And then he picked up a glass of water little plastic bottle of water. It's about half full. He said, Spirit, he's teaching me, Spirit is like water. Watch. And he drops it on the floor, and then he stomps on it. And then he gets both feet on it, and he's jumping up and down on this bottle. My wife and I are looking at each other like, what is happening? And eventually he crushes that bottle until it's completely smithereens all the way down to the bottom, but the cap was still on. So he picks up the bottle. There's still water in there, and he says, you see, the water's okay. I've never heard a more profound description of the life process from anyone, and I've heard a lot of monks talk about the life process. But that idea that our spirit is like water, it evaporates, it goes up into the heavens, it comes down, it waters plants, it nutri it helps us, it, we drink it, and then we become another person again. The water is always okay. So then I, uh, then I just kept filming people over and over and over because it became addictive. Friends of mine would say, gee, I read your book and I don't believe a word you're saying, but... Um, and and it, I'll just tell you one, just to end, um, one, this one person I took to a session, she said, um, this is the woman with the tumor. She had a tumor, she was having an operation, and she was saying to me, I don't believe in, I can be hypnotized, but if this can help my operation, that'll be great. So we drove out to Claremont together, uh, where this hypnotherapist is that I work with, and she quickly went into a past life of a guy in Arizona whose wife had left him out the buckboard, pushed him out of the buckboard, and left him to die in the desert. And she went through this whole detail about this guy's life. And I was able to look up and find the name of his town from 1820 and a lot of details that she said. But basically, she got to a point where this guy was dying in the desert, and then she saw herself, a spirit, sort of stepping away from him. And she said she saw herself as like a 10-year-old like a girl stepping out of this 80-year-old guy. And, and then the hypnotherapist says, so what's your emotion right now? She went, I'm ecstatic. I always wanted to be a cranky old man, and I did it. <laughs> I thought, well, that's weird. From a person who went from, you know, this, I can't be hypnotized. So she went to her soul group. And, you know, I find that when I bring people to these sessions who aren't, they don't have a presenting problem, they have pretty profound stuff. Her soul group was in the midst of playing a game of hide-and-seek. Oh, describe the game. Well, you can be invisible. So you have to find all, all five of your fellow soulmates where they're hiding invisibly on different realms. So other planes. So to win the game, you've got to wrap them all up at the same time. Oh, there you are. Oh, there you are. Her description of it was pretty unusual. Let's just say that. Then she said... Then we get to the, the, her spirit guide. And is there anyone around who can help us answer some of the questions you've written? Yes, my spirit guide's here. All right, well, let's talk about this uh, operation you're about to have. Spirit guide says, it's nothing. It's no big deal. It's just a physical thing. Get it taken care of. Go in. Your doctors are good. It'll be fine. Her follow-up question, is there anything that the hypnotherapist can help us to examine or, you know, to help me spiritually so, you know, I can cure myself? And the spirit guide says, what, is he a surgeon? Which I thought was a pretty sarcastic thing for a spirit guide to say. <laughs> but his point was, I just told you, it's okay. Not everything is spirit-based. 
You know, and I'm fond of saying that's the big thing that's missing in our medicine, modern medicine, our world. We talk about nurture, we talk about nature. Everything is either genetic or it's sociological. Our whole medical practice is based on that. But there's another modality out there, and there's a spiritual journey of your soul that goes from lifetime to lifetime, and there may be something in your life that's related to that. It may not be, but it's just another arrow in your quiver when you're trying to help somebody. So don't ignore it. Examine it. You know, I, I, that's just a, a basis. But her two big questions that she had, and, she, and they're big questions because she didn't think she could be hypnotized, so she wrote them down, these big questions. One was, what's the meaning of the shift? She had heard, like, people, you know, talking about the shift, the coming shift. Is that something to worry about? End of the days, you know, that stuff. What's the shift? And the other one was, what is God? Okay, and I... You know, as a, a friend who's, who's watching this unfold and thinking, wow, this is amazing, she's gotten this far. I'm filming it. The therapist is there working with her. And then I thought, oh, boy, she brought in these tough questions. I've never heard anybody ask this before. So she says, he says, is, is there anywhere we can go to answer these questions? And she says, ah, I'm in the Akashic Hall of Records. She says, I'm in this great library with stacks that are 40 feet high, and there are tables where the screens come out of the tables and you can examine your past lives, and we're going through this amazing library where all this information is. And then the question is, what about the shift? And the spirit guide says, again, the little bit of a curmudgeon, this fellow, says, you humans always feel the need to name something so that you can get a handle on it including the shift. Some of us call it the quickening here and not the shift. I thought that was interesting. However, in terms of the cosmos, it's not such a big deal. But if you want to understand what it is, imagine yourself being a crab walking on the ocean floor and the crab suddenly opens his eyes and realizes he's in an ocean. That's a shift in consciousness. I thought that was so interesting because, you know, the Higgs boson particle, the Higgs boson article, the stuff about science and the Higgs boson, the field that's, that's, that maybe we're all connected like water, that is connected to that. So that I thought that was interesting. And that, that maybe the shift that we're coming to is where we can all experience each other simultaneously. Not only reading other thoughts, but reading your emotions, feeling your heart, feeling what you're going through. That would be wonderful. But he said it with a chuckle. But the other one, and relates to us and here, is what is God? And should I wait until later on to answer that? No, I'm kidding. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. All right. I know I've, I've, tra I've tortured you for an hour and a half, and we're going to get to the questions right now after I finish this. But here's what he said. He said, and I just thought it was interesting, and it bears repeating. What is God? And he said... God is beyond the capacity of the human brain to comprehend. However, if you want to, you can experience God. And the way to do that is to open your heart to everyone. And by opening your heart, I've heard this before, don't judge anyone. Open your heart to everyone and to all things, and then you can experience God. Wow. So I'll close on that. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> all right, and now are any questions? And please, if you need to use the restroom or something like that, please go ahead. But are any questions at all? I'm, they've given me a a little bit of time to answer <laughs> anything. Repeat the questions for the tape. I shall repeat those questions for the tape. Okay. Anybody? Yes. When you brought it up, Mary. The, I guess this is the 2012 that you're talking about with crab in the ocean. Yeah. So it's a, only a shift in consciousness. It's not mass destruction on the earth. That's exactly what he said. And I've heard that repeated in different ways. I'll tell you, I heard, I had a, 
I had a person who I didn't film, but the hypnotherapist, I had asked him, if, if anything weird comes across your counter, you know, let me see if I can hear it, and then I'll talk to the guy, and it's in the book. But this guy claimed that he normally reincarnates on another planet. Newton mentions this in his work. He calls them hybrids. He said about one, is about 10%. That's the way he put it in the book. 10% of the clients that he sees claim that normally, that's why they're having such a difficult life, because they normally are somewhere else. So it's really awkward for them to have to deal with emotions. But this guy said very descriptive about his planet and the people that are with him here on Earth. And a lot of them, he said, are working in the media and helping to alter the consciousness of the planet by doing these films. And then he said, there's going to be, you know, and I, I, take, I take any prediction of the future with a grain of salt because we have free will and we have the ability to change things, et cetera, et cetera. You know the answer to that. But he said, uh, in the next five to seven years, there will be an ET-like event, some kind of outer space connecting with us. Um, and then he says that people from his planet who are here, all in human form, are helping seed the planet to help us adjust to that event. Now, he's not the only one. So I brought this up on, on Facebook. There's a Michael Newton uh, page where people talk about this stuff, and there are hypnotherapists all over the world sort of sign in and go, oh, I had a client, blah, 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 which I think is great. We're able to share it. But uh, Peter Smith, the head of the Newton Institute, said, we've had an increase in those reports. So he said about 30% of all reports that we have where we're doing a Life Between Life session, somebody claims they're not normally incarnating here. And our friend in Los Angeles told me it's gone up to 50% in his clientele, where people, you know, they come to see him, and then in the session they go, I am normally on this other planet, but I'm here to help people with this coming blah, blah, whatever it is. So, you know, the, I haven't heard any reports of anything of destruction. We all know the Earth is going through changes. We know that, and we know the Earth is going to go through changes, and it always has. But nothing about anything that... However, when people... When, if something like that happens, you can imagine a lot of people are very stressed over somebody coming from another planet and altering their point of view of what they've been living with. So the idea is, is that this information, however it gets out to people you know, they have at least something to fall back on. Oh, what did that guy say? You know, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be so stressed over this, that this is okay. Uh, you know, God's not taking us all. You see? That's what the reports are. I actually was going to ask that question. <laughs> see, I anticipated it. I knew that. <laughs> anyone? 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 Go ahead. Welcome to my world. But I just wondered if something that whole third rock from the sun analogy. Yeah. So now we have great sociological shifts in the world. Both physically in terms of how people keep themselves. Uh-huh. In terms of tattoos, piercing, what was the reason in the world. Wonder if any of that's coming from other planets because it's never Well that's funny. That's funny. Well, I would, being a, one, you know, a fan of history and a fan of other cultures and a big fan of just all, all things odd, um, you know, I spent some time in India and I've spent some time in different parts, remote parts of the planet, and the Maoris, as you know, have been, you know, living that cool, painted life for centuries. And other people, you know, even back to the Egyptians, where people would do a certain amount of hair coloring and paint and stuff like that. It's sort of been this weird thing where, as humans, we always feel like, we got to alter this somehow, make it more interesting. You know, people say it's the plumage. But just in the point, that point, to take that point. But I don't, you know, I, I'm just saying this is what the reports are. And uh, by the way, the guy who claimed to be from this other planet, I, you know, I met with him and I had lunch with him because I wanted to see if he was other planet-like or... <laughs> You know, did he spend his life watching uh, Star Trek movies? You know, where did this come from? Because I, you know, I'm trying to, I, tr I generally tried not to put anything in the book where there somebody else didn't have the same kind of experience. I tried to, you know, this is only one guy. But I can just tell you, in his normal life, he's a normal fella. 
you know, he's, he works in a hospice. He takes care of elderly people. He's uh, very shy. Um, he was as astounded by what he was... Oh, and by the way, when he started speaking in, from the point of view of a spirit guide, he was speaking like 10 times faster than I've ever heard anyone speak. It really took me months to transcribe what he was saying. He was talking and he was downloading chunks of information that was in the syntax of like a Yoda-like character. But um, let me just say this. It's a misnomer that when you talk to a spirit guide, spirit guides are all-knowing. This is what I found. Spirit guides are on a path themselves. My spirit guide described it to me, if this is valuable to you, the process. He said he went through all of his lifetimes, and then he became a spirit guide. And his graduation gift was me. <laughs> and that he and I, he saw himself as a painter. And he said, imagine a blank canvas and every lifetime Rich has is another color. And the two of us work out what that canvas is going to look like. And by the time he goes through all of his lifetimes, Rich will be prepared to accept as a graduation gift somebody else and watch over them for all their lifetimes. Mm, no, not a good idea. No, I wouldn't do that. Oh, you did it again. <laughs> My point being only that the process is sort of uniform for us, it's also uniform for the aliens. They have a, you know, I mean, guys who normally incarnate on another planet, they have a spirit guide and they have a council. It's just like everybody. Everybody has that. So if they're here, this is the part where it kind of gets a little, you know, like, what? We don't have to be here. There are other places to incarnate. I say in my session, I think it was, the, I did a second session two years later, just to sort of confirm everything. And in my second session, I said, you can learn more from one day of tragedy. You can learn more spiritually from one day of tragedy on Earth than you can from 5,000 years on one of these other planets that are boring. This is the ballpark. This is where everybody wants to come because this is the most, you can learn, there's the, the, the polarities are so great here. Does that make sense? <laughs> no, it doesn't, but, you know, it's something to consider. Go ahead. In your research, have you found any confirmation of the abduction phenomena and what that's about? Very interesting. I was with Bruce Grayson two days ago. Dr. Grayson is at the He's University of Virginia. Oh, sorry, you're right. I didn't do that. The question was, in this research, anything with abduction or UFOs? Um, and I myself had done that research, and John Mack at Harvard had done that research, and I was a you know, fan of his work, and then, as we know, things went south for him, and he died, and, and then at some point he's kind of discredited his own research, and he'd come upon the idea that perhaps people were making these things up. Um, and that's the problem with hypnosis, by and large, with the scientific community. And like I said, I met with Dr. Grayson two days ago at the University of Virginia. There group studies reincarnation, but they also study NDEs. He's been, that's his expertise. I talked to Jim Tucker, who does reincarnation. They also have guys who do remote viewing. They're studying all of this in a scientific way. Ian Stevenson didn't believe in hypnosis, so they don't believe in hypnosis. So my pitch to them was hypnosis as it's been practiced is not what Newton is doing. It's not one-hour sessions. These are five- and six-hour sessions. And when you have somebody that long, they get to something that's like a deeper truth. And e even if it is just for them, then you compare what other people are saying to other people. All right, so to your question, which I've avoided. They, we talked about that briefly, and that, you know, that's one of the reasons they, they don't um, do any UFO research is because there's so many accounts, and, and it's really hard to pin down what's going on. All I can say is from my own, I know, I haven't had any accounts of anybody seeing any of that in all, all of my research, and Newton doesn't mention it at all. So it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means I haven't come across it. My own point of view is, yeah, it makes total sense. Other people, other planets, like us, they come by, they abduct people, whatever, they're doing experiments, they're trying to figure stuff out. But there's another method <laughs> to get to Earth. You don't have to breathe our oxygen. You just have to, you have to be part of that process that you know, allows you to... I'll tell you, there's a book called My Life After Life 
they're written by a doctor named Ken Stoller. His son was 16 years old when he died. And the son came through to him via psychic. And the son said, Dad, you need to write a book. So he started writing a book about his life, Ken Stoller. Ah, I did this, I did that. And then the son came through and said, no, no, not a book about you, about me. <laughs> I'll help you write it. And so the son has channeled what he's experiencing now to his father. It's a short book. But he describes going to classrooms. That's why I got interested in it. He describes a student in the classroom. So I'm getting this experience of what a student is like. You know, the guy who looked around at me. Students going to classes in the afterlife. And in one of the classes, in came what he described as like an alien creature who was there to learn what it was like to be human. So when he was going to become a human, he could understand a little bit better. And he, they became friends, according to this account. So, you know, I, I, the thing is, I just, what I keep hearing over and over and over again in the sessions from every council is you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. You're doing what you signed up to learn. You're doing a great job. Stop being critical on yourself. Stop judging other people. Be a loving person. Be compassionate. But you're doing the right thing, and everything is going to be okay. I hear that time and time again. So that takes the fear aspect out of any research that UFO at all. So if the UFO thing is happening, then it's for a good reason, and we are agreeing to it. If that makes any sense. Long way to get to that answer. Go ahead. Um, and do you have any theories like a spirit guide? Do they have just one soul they usually work with? Or Great question. Um, pretty, I'll well, repeat the question. Uh, do spirit guides just work solo? Or do they work with more than one person? Um, there are more accounts of more than one spirit guide. But when you ask people, who is that other person with you? The, the answers were like a waitress who's learning. So like... So you have a secondary person who's there just as an assistant. They are observing the same things the spirit guy is observing. So they're being helpful. So you could access both of them. And perhaps more than one, I guess. It's possible. But then there was another account where there was a spirit guide with somebody else. And the client said, so who are you with? And the spirit guide said, that's none of your business. And then they, they asked, the therapist asked it a different way. Well, you know, if you could really say, if, is it a male or female, the spirit guide said, I, did you hear me? It's really not your concern. It's somebody else that I'm dealing with. Now, in my case, and I can speak more clearly about me, my spirit guide said, well, you know, that's what everybody thinks. One person, one spirit guide. But, you know, do the math, he said. Two-thirds of your energy is back here. One third of your energy is there. You're only awake two thirds of the day. Do I really need to be watching over every moment you're doing? So he said, it might be a source of consternation. That was his quote, for people to realize that their spirit guide has more than one client. <laughs> really? <laughs> so meaning, like you know, maybe he's got like ten people he's working on. Like, I just don't. Rich, no, I'm here, what? You know, so, so I, you know, listen, I'm talking about the tip of an iceberg of research in this area, but from, from what I understand, they generally say it's one person and they watch over all your lifetimes, and sometimes I'll incarnate with you. In my case, he said he was my grandfather when I asked him to be once. I don't remember what that was, but generally it's one and one. And if there's an assistant, it's somebody who's learning the process. But, you know, uh, there are, then there's accounts where, where you, uh, you meet, you run into your spirit guide, and then there's somebody right next to them, but it's like your aunt. So they're, it's almost like they're working together. They're pals. You know, everyone has a, has a council or, or a soul group. So your spirit guides have one, too. You know, they didn't get rid of that. So... There's that possibility, too. You hang out with your spirit. You, you access your spirit. You're like, who are all these other people around here? Eh, don't just ignore those people. There, you know, there are other people that, I'm, that know you because I'm with you. You see? Also, in terms of spirit guides, they say that when people have an account of Jesus, let's say, Todd Bumpo's account of seeing Jesus, 
that spirit guides frequently frequently will appear as an individual so that it's easy for you to handle what you're experiencing knowing that it's going to be too intense if you're somebody else so they say that I'll, they'll appear as Muhammad as Buddha as Jesus as whatever Newton has a case I didn't I didn't experience it but I read it and I thought it was fascinating a minister went to Newton and in his session when he got to the between life stuff he said oh my god it's Satan suddenly Satan's coming for me and Newton said what does he look like he's got the horns he's got the red eyes there's flames around him he's coming oh my god this is a nightmare <gasps> help me and Newton who's done you know thousands of sessions and never seen Satan said well can you describe what what his clothes are like and the client looked down and he said he's wearing tennis shoes <laughs> and then in that moment saw that his spirit guide had presented himself as the person he had been lording over his flock his whole life had shown him what it was like to feel fear the fear that he had given his parishioners in, in terms of trying to get power and, you know, fame and frightening people. And so when the, I was able to sort of re literally remove the mask and say, dude, you know. <laughs> the other funny thing I've heard is uh, spirit guides who show up to a ghost, uh, a ghost, somebody who's decided that they feel more comfortable here. It's not that they're stuck here. It's not that their karma has put them here. They choose to hang here. They'll say, I just felt comfortable going in and out of this house. But you're outside of time, so you're doing it for 250 years. It's nothing to you. You're just doing it. But they, there are accounts where the spirit guide will show up after 250 years and go, do you think maybe it's time we go back? Because once you go back in that journey, then you go back to your soul group and et cetera, et cetera. For them, it's like, what took you so long? What are you still doing there? Come on, we've been waiting for you. we got games to play. Hide and seek. Whatever it is. But that's a, that's a reframe, you know, that, that we have the uh, power and the uh, free will between lives. That we can choose not to be somebody. We don't want to. And we agree to be somebody if we want to. That's, I don't know, I think that's unusual. Yes? Uh, the comment question based on a previous question about the shift. Uh huh. Um, I'm a hypnotherapist and I specialize in whole life between life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> and, uh, you have someone in your midst who can help you. Um, I'd say something about, about 90% of the people that I have hypnotized referring to the 2012 the shift. Uh, the thing that's been consistent is that there is going to be some physical changes in the earth, mm -hmm. but when they experience it, it's not a fearful thing. Like, yeah, it's going to take place, but it's somehow not going to matter because people always want to know, where do I go? What do I do? And it isn't. It's the most important thing, and this was consistent, is that you got to uh, maintain a connection to whatever your concept of higher self or source or God is. Because if you have that, then you'll know what to do. And, and I'm wondering, That's the question to you is that when you're talking about that, no, there's not going to be any big thing, that it's a matter of perception, it's that it really doesn't matter because if you're in an area that's dangerous and it's time for you to go home, it's like, right. oh, well, and, and if you're not, you're connected and you're going to know what to do. And somehow there's not a need to worry. There is, a, um, and I'm, I'm speaking from portions of different uh, sessions, is that there are times, there might be a little bit of violence, there might be a little bit of, Stress. Yeah, but that's all temporary. And then, because some, uh, there was this one particular client, she was like all stressing out. And I said, you know, she was getting very upset. And I said, okay, go mm -hmm. forward after this. And then it was just peaceful for her. And she, and, 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 and she was just ecstatic because there is uh, this awakening, this feeling of all connectedness. Together. Yeah, connectedness mm -hmm. and awareness. So that none of this really matters. So there's not a reason to fear. The most, yeah. That's the thing you should not do. And so part of all this is the awakening to realize that it doesn't really matter, that this is all right. part of what's going to No, I, and I, I think it's very profound, and I appreciate you saying that. I mean, you know, the reason I mentioned that account is yeah. because it is contrary to what everybody says. And I, but I, but I acknowledge... But I think it goes hand in hand, I think, because it's, 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 it's,
as he said, it's not in terms of the cosmos, yeah. it's not that big of a deal. But you know, from a, um, from my point of view, I live in Santa Monica, so if you know if there's going to be a tidal wave, it's going to knock out my village. It'd be nice to know so I could you know get my kids out of the way. But somehow, if you're connected, you'll know what to do. That's true. But then, then there's also the argument you can make. Okay, if I get killed by a tidal wave, okay, listen, you can't kill a person. Exactly. That's so. Exactly. That's hard to really get your mind around and to really accept. And I, I mentioned to Cheryl the other day. My son said something really disturbing, and I share it to you. Uh, I share it with you, in private, except for this camera. Uh, no, I just realized there's a camera. I can't share it. I can't share it. But um, no, I don't. I actually, it's a very personal thing. But let me just say this. He said something that was disconcerting, about the future, and uh, not about your future but about his future. And I sat him down and said, now listen, you said this disconcerting thing and your mom is never going to you know, let that go. She's going to every day think about what you said. So we really have to think about this. And I said, but we have free will and you have the capacity to change whatever you think your path is on this planet. It's not easy to do. But you meditate on it, stay connected to source, and you know maybe you'll have the opportunity to, to adjust that, to alter that, to say, hey, you know, I said I was going to do this, but I'm not. Anyway, that's you know, I think we have the capacity through meditation. Oh, and by the way, I want to teach you guys a meditation. Can I? Yeah. Okay. This was taught to me by uh, Robert Thurman, and uh, by the way, he's got a fantastic book. It's called The Jewel Tree. We got about six minutes. It's the Jewel Tree Meditation. All right? And it helps. I'm going to teach you two meditations because that's how good I am. <laughs> They're both very valuable, and I'll tell you why in a second. So the first one is the Jewel Tree Meditation. So if you don't mind, close your eyes for a second, everybody. Just sort of relax. Take a deep breath. You don't have to close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Picture yourself in a really wonderful setting, perhaps by a lake by the ocean. could be right out here in the bay. You could be sitting in the sand in a chair. Feel the wonderful heat that's coming from the sun. Feel the wind as it sort of ripples through and maybe there's a tree nearby. There you can hear the sound of the leaves and the birds chirping. It's a wonderful setting of great peace and joy and relaxation. And now in front of you, I want you to imagine coming out of this body of water a magnificent tree, the most magnificent tree you've ever seen, just rising up out of that water and sitting in the heart of that tree, right in the center of that tree, picture your most beloved. It could be a spiritual person. It could be your root mentor, as they say in Tibet. It could be your teacher could be your parents, could be a child, could be somebody that you have unconditional love for and respect. And now take a look at them and see how happy they are to be sitting in this tree with you. And now imagine a shaft of light coming out of your heart and zooming right up into that individual and showering them with this incredible love. And they return the shaft of love and light and compassion and wisdom to you so that it smacks you right in the head. And you can feel like a brilliant light shining on you and you can feel the energy coming from the love and the knowledge that this person has about you and about your life. How wonderful to be in this moment with them. And now picture behind them and around them other people that you have the equivalent or close to the equivalent amount of love for, respect for, could be a teacher, could be a student, could be a parent, could be a loved one here or passed on, doesn't matter. And see how much they're excited by being here and a little startled as well. What the heck am I doing in this tree? But they send, are now are part of the shaft of light that you're sending to them. This healing, full of wisdom, compassionate light. And then feel as that light comes right back into you. Bang! You can feel it like a wave of radiation. 
enveloping you. And now in the tree, start to see people that you see on a daily basis, people that you're not necessarily like or dislike. They could be friends. Let's put the friends in there. People that you love at a distance, people that you've known since your childhood, somebody who helped you when you were a kid. Send them the equal amount of loving grace, and they send it back to you. And now we get to the outer ridge parts of the tree, and you put in people you see on a daily basis you don't even know. They could be your mailman. They could be a bank teller. They could be somebody who served you coffee. Because they need love as much as anybody. And if you were close friends with them, they would be in your circle. And they're startled to be there. But give them that same amount of wisdom, compassion, and love. And then in the outer ring, put the people you hate. People who've been a stone in your path. People who've criticized you or demeaned you or made you feel bad or cut you off in traffic. Put them out there on the tree. And they are startled to be there. Because when they normally see you, they run the other way. But now you've got them trapped in your tractor beam of love. And give them that equal parts of love. Because as the Dalai Lama will point out, if circumstances were different, if you found yourself trapped in a car with this person in the Himalayas, Things might turn out different. You might turn to be a friend. Because what's the difference between an enemy and a friend? It's just a matter of perspective. So give them that same energy of love. And have them send it back to you. Meditate on that. See them in that tree. Give them as much love as you can. And then you start to bring them gifts. That's the fuller version of this jewel tree meditation where you put jewels around them and you bring them clothing and you bring them all sorts of gifts. But for now, I just want you to picture them all as perfect love and then slowly, slowly let them disappear, let them fade. Let them disappear until you get back to your root mentor, you get back to the one person you're so connected with on a spiritual level and thank them for being part of your life, for allowing you to learn something spiritual. And now we turn the light off and we're back sitting in our chair in the ARE auditorium. How's that? The Jewel Tree Meditation of Tibet, courtesy of Robert Thurman, taught to me while on a mountainside in Tibet. And I won't teach you this meditation when I have time, but I just want to tell you the science behind this meditation. Turns out, if you look up Richard Davidson at the University of Wisconsin, he has shown that one single meditation where you think about healing someone else heals you. It changes the shape of the amygdala. And the amygdala is where all depression resides. People take Prozac to stop the amygdala from firing, misfiring. But he's shown one single meditation of thinking about healing someone else, especially if you don't like them, heals you. The act of sacrifice and compassion cures yourself. And for me, there's no greater message I can impart to you today, which is you have the ability to heal yourself. And who knows if the person, and what happens is you run into the guy that you hated so much, there it's weird, I've seen it, where people, they suddenly, it's like somehow they feel that you were thinking about them. And they start to change. So that's worth the experiment, alone. But the other part of it, the amygdala, uh, that's a fantastic way. I, I saw Davidson speak at UCLA. I went up to, and he was talking to these psychiatrists in LA, and they were all trying to get kids off Prozac. And I said to him, what is the particular meditation you use when you do this study? And he said, it's called Tonglen, T-O-N-G-L-E-N. And it's a little more specific. That would have been the other meditation. But it's more specific. You just take one person, picture them in front of you, your friend, whoever it is. And as you meditate on them, you pull their illness into you. As odd as that sounds. But once it hits you, you dissolve it in a brilliant healing light. And then you push the golden healed light back into them. 
You do that over and over and over again. This give and take. Tonglen means give and take. You take the illness and you give health. Take it and give health. And the weird part is, it changes the shape of your amygdala. It makes you a happier person. It cures depression. How about that? Okay, very good. Let's go eat. Oh, thank you. How was that, Dick? Is that right? Am I right about the time? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Now, if we thought of ourselves as crabs with our eyes open, now we're crabs with our eyes, I mean, our closed, now we're crabs with our eyes open. Very nice. And how appropriate that is, thinking of the awakening. Yeah. Because, now, you have a book and you have a movie. Right. Are they for sale? Yes. Each, even the movies for sale? Movies for sale. I have 10 copies of the movie and 20 copies of the book. How much are they and how can we get them? They're at the bookstore. I think they're 20 each or two for 30. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, we're going to show the movie so you don't have to buy the movie, you know. But if you're interested in what the movie says, the transcripts are all.